Hey, what's going on? It's John, and it's time for the Jmart cast for Monday, April 4th. What's going on? How are your friends and family? Thanks for listening in another week. Hope you've had a great week. Mine's been good. What have I been up to? I got a new haircut on Tuesday. Went to see an old training client of mine who has switched careers and become a hairdresser. And so I went to get... Well, I just recently got my haircut, so I just went to get the sides redone again, basically, because I have like this new cool haircut now where the top is long and the sides are short. So you got to keep the sides short to keep it looking good. So yeah, I went to get the haircut. It's funny, my friend is still, you know, learning. So even just like getting the sides cut took two hours. (laughs) Not complaining, but it's just funny because, you know, you wouldn't think that that would take that long, but you know. He's always just trying his best to make it like the best, uh, I don't know, experience. And so he, you know, just puts so much effort into the every little detail that like I can't help but appreciate it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, it's funny. I was on my way out from the um, salon, hair salon. I was walking home. I was walking towards the subway station that I was going to take to get home and on my way I ran across some people who I don't know who they are or anything but it was funny because I these two people came across each other I'm not sure if they knew who, who they if they knew each other from before but one of them looked at the other person's sweater and said hey that's a really good 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 sweater you made a comp give him a compliment for the nice sweater and the other person said thank you and also pointed out hey did you see how did you see the blue he said he said this it's the ukraine blue (laughs) and i guess he was trying to show like he's supporting ukraine by wearing a blue sweater honestly to me it didn't even look like the ukraine blue but aren't you supposed to have like the combination of blue and yellow if you're going to support ukraine (laughs) uh that's just like people's desire to just jump in and support the new current thing kind of fascinates me You know, and this guy's just like every little thing, right? Even just the nice blue sweater he's got. Hey, it supports Ukraine because it's the same blue. (laughs) Just made me laugh. Another thing that made me laugh today was a buddy of mine. I think that was, this is on Thursday now, called me at 10 in the evening. It's like almost bedtime calls me to talk, call me (laughs) to like, um, you know, pretend get mad at me, not really get mad at me, but like, he's like calling me a bastard in a kind of fun, friendly kind of way. And it turns out that like a while back, this is many years ago now, we went to a world juniors game together and it was a game of, I think Russia versus, versus Switzerland. I think that was the two teams. And we were like, I w- he asked me to say something in Russian, like a taunt or something to the Russian team. So what I ended up teaching him was this phrase in Russian, which I'll say now is Ya Galuboy. <laughs> if anyone speaks Russian, you know that that's hilarious because what it, essentially, and I don't remember doing this, but essentially what I taught him to say in Russian is I'm gay. It, the direct translation is I'm blue, but that's just what it means in Russian is if you say I'm blue in Russian, it means I'm gay. So I taught, taught him how to say uh, I'm blue in Russian and he was yelling that all along. Uh, like I remember this now, but <laughs> he was yell- yelling that all during the game at the Russian team, so that was hilarious. And then, I guess just earlier this week, uh, he ha- he was playing soccer with a bu- some buddies, and he's got a Russian player on the team who told him that that's not what he thinks it means. <laughs> and so he called me to cuss me out, I guess, a little bit. <laughs> oh, that was hilarious! Yeah. What else happened this week? Another funny thing happened. uh, Went on a bit of a coffee trip to the nearby uh, awesome coffee place called Oakwood Espresso with both kids by myself. So I had a stroller with my daughter in it and I have a boogie board attachment that my son can stand on. And I was pushing both of them basically as we have, it's like a 15, 20 minute walk to the to the coffee shop and we were walking and it was a nice sunny day or check 
checking out our surroundings and my son was like pointing something out out to me and just as I look at what he's pointing out to me I step in dog poop (laughs) Uh, it was funny but luckily it wasn't too bad I was able to get most of it off (laughs) but yeah always walk watch where you're walking kids (laughs) kids <laughs> what else this week i went to jiu-jitsu twice um both days were learning throws and like side break fall as well basically a lot of practicing falling because um my uh, my professor for the for the class is like a black belt both in brazilian jiu-jitsu and judo and so in judo a lot of the techniques are from standing and there's a lot of throws and and trips and and things along those lines so that's kind of what we've been focusing on so he's basically like sneaking in the judo techniques into our brazilian jiu-jitsu class not that i mind or anything but yeah been learning uh, practicing falls and and this week's particularly it's practicing falling on your side you know you can fall on your front you can fall on your back and sides as well so more so on the sides and then doing throws and i'm back you might not have noticed but i uh, had to stop the recording and go attend to my daughter. I'm recording this late in the evening on Sunday night, and I just heard her wake up and cry a little bit, so I had to go and get in there and give her a little feed. She's usually not supposed to be up this early into her uh, nighttime, but nighttime sleep. But what are you gonna do? So went in there and fed her real quick and put her back down. We're good. And a funny thing happened as I'm coming back down just before uh, coming down the stairs. I checked into my son's bedroom and I noticed he was a little bit close to the edge of the bed. So I went in and uh, tried to like gently kind of nudge him a little bit closer to the center, you know, so he wouldn't fall off the bed or anything. And uh, he woke up and (laughs) locked eyes with me. And first thing he says is, no. (laughs) But then he, like, I just kind of gently shushed him back to sleep. It was fun. It's just hilarious to me that he, like, wakes up, locks eyes with me and says no as his first response. Uh, funny kids. Anyways, let's move on to thread reading portion of the podcast. Before I do that, maybe I'll just say, if you're listening and you're enjoying the podcast, could you please take a moment and review the podcast, give it five stars if you think it's worth that. Even if you don't, still give it five stars anyway. Just joking. And another thing you could do is possibly share the podcast with somebody who is also into listening to these kinds of shows and possibly is looking for a new one to get into. If you could find one person in your life who is looking for a new podcast and share this with them, that would be awesome. Appreciate that very much. Thank you. And so moving on. I'm going to read today a thread about breath and the nervous system. This thread is written on Twitter by a person with the handle Michael Ammons. Michael spelled the regular way, Ammons, A-M-M-O-N-S, at Michael Ammons. All right, so he says that your breath is your bridge into your subconscious mind. Your autonomic nervous system is responsible for all the bodily processes that the conscious mind has no control over. For example, digestion, breathing, heartbeat, blood pressure, body temperature, hormone responses, all of these fall into the autonomic nervous system control. There's more, of course. Um, The autonomic nervous system is broken down into two primary systems, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system exists to maintain homeostasis in the body. So homeostasis really referring to a point of equilibrium. For example, body temperature is homeostatic. There's an optimal level and when body temperature increases above the optimal level, then internal processes work to bring it down and vice versa. Anyway, so the parasympathetic nervous system maintains homeostasis. It is also known as the rest and digest system. 
when you are in a parasympathetic state, your body is calm, composed, it's able to heal, and it's prevented from overworking. Your parasympathetic nervous system works to relax muscles, secrete saliva, contract pupils, reduces heart rate, it constricts the airways, it stimulates the intestines, and it stimulates the gallbladder. The sympathetic nervous system controls the body's fight or flight response. It primarily functions to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, inhibit digestive activity, increase respiration, increase the heart rate, and tense muscles. So the fight or flight system is aptly named so because of the physiological changes that I already said that are happening in the body are preparing you for the absolute worst. You either have to basically run for your life or fight to the death. So how does the breath play into all this? Well, breath is the one and only body rhythm that is controlled by your autonomic nervous system that can also be controlled consciously. As I'm reading this thread, my breath is automatic, but I can also stop and consciously take a deep breath. (sighs) The breath is special and unique in this way. We can intentionally use the breath to communicate to our subconscious, to our autonomic nervous system. This is what is meant by a portal into the subconscious mind. In a parasympathetic state, the breathing is slow, calm, into the belly, and through the nose. Your autonomic nervous system is in this state when you're sleeping, calm and relaxed, digesting and healing. In a sympathetic state, your breathing is fast, usually through the mouth, with the goal of uptaking as much oxygen as possible. Imagine if you were in a full-out run. You'd be breathing through your mouth, into the chest, heart rate accelerated. So the autonomic nervous system affects your respiration. Is it possible that the opposite is true? Can we affect the state of our nervous system through our rate of respiration? The answer is yes, I totally agree. Let's dive into how our breathing can change the state of your nervous system. We've already explored that emotions such as fear create a fight or flight response and the fight or flight response increases the respiratory rate. The opposite is also true. By breathing more quickly, we can upregulate our nervous system. I've definitely done that when you like huff and puff a lot. And I've seen my kid do that as well. When he just like breathes a lot, all of a sudden he gets more and more angry. (laughs) Anyways, the thread goes on. You don't want to intentionally induce a fight or flight response in your day to day life, but we can utilize our breath with intention to increase energy and focus throughout the day with a simple rule. This rule is that we focus on making inhales longer than exhales. Follow this cadence for anywhere from one to five minutes for six seconds inhale and three seconds exhale. Some results that you may feel include feeling more awake, aware, and focused. It's like having a cup of coffee without the jitters and it's free apparently. (laughs) All you need is your focused attention on your breath. Now you can also do a similar thing to downregulate your nervous system. If you're having trouble sleeping or find yourself anxious, stressed, or nervous, you can downregulate your nervous system using the same rule as above, uh, but the opposite. So to downregulate, you make your exhales longer than your inhales. So follow this cadence anywhere from 3 to 10 minutes to downregulate your nervous system. So 4 second inhale, 4 second breath hold, 6 second exhale, 2 second breath hold. This is also known as box breathing. Actually, from my experience, box breathing is four seconds all around for both the inhale, exhale, as well as the breath holds. Uh, But it it adds up the same total amount, so it doesn't really matter, I guess. But yeah, four seconds inhale, four seconds breath hold. In this case, six second exhale and two second breath hold. Some things to note while you're practicing intentional breathing. Breathe deeply into the belly. Breathe nasally only. Avoid breathing into the chest. Focus on using the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is that muscle that basically you can think of it as cutting your body in half. And it 
pushes down when you breathe in and it pushes back up as you breathe out. As you breathe in, it pushes down and creates more space in the abdomen for air to get in. And as you exhale, it pushes back up and forces all that air to come out through the lungs. And lastly, be intentional. Quiet your thoughts when possible. Hmm, quiet your thoughts. I'm not sure if quieting thoughts really works. Thoughts are always coming in no matter no matter what. It's more of just remembering to note the thoughts and let them pass by and then re-centering back on the breath. I think that's the most important thing. The thoughts are going to keep coming no matter what. Hmm. All right, we're at 15 or 16 minutes. Yeah, why not? Let's keep going. I want to read another thread that I found really interesting. All right. This thread is written by an account with the handle at Mr. Salazzo. Uh, M-R-S-O-L-L-O-Z-Z-O. All right. And some of the stuff that he's written here is pretty crazy, but I ended up like doing a little fact check on Wikipedia and it checks out. So let's read this and go through it together. See, see what you think. In 1929, Wilhelm Jur Stephenson. <laughs> uh, so I ended up Googling this guy's name and, or duck, duck going, not Googling. And then you basically takes you to his, um, Wikipedia page and it says he was actually it's, it's a very Icelandic name of course but he was born in Manitoba Canada this guy was born in 1879 and died in 1962 lived a long life died as an 82 year old and so in 1928 this guy ate nothing but meat and water for an entire year what happened next was astonishing. All right, so let's read the thread. Wilhelmur Stephenson was a famous Arctic explorer whose expeditions are beyond legendary. He lived with the Inuit and learned to eat and thrive off their native Arctic foods. In 1928, Stephenson determined that he was ready for his next challenge. No, this challenge would not be another overseas voyage, but rather a challenge that he could complete right in New York City. He decided he would eat nothing but meat and water for an entire year. Wow. <laughs> Stephenson wanted to prove the effectiveness of the Inuit diet that he watched the indigenous population consume for years. He watched them consume a primary meat and fish diet that consisted of seals, whale, caribou, waterfowl, with very limited vegetable consumption. By conventional measures, the Inuit had no business being healthy. They spent months in the darkness of winter, unable to hunt or do real work. However, Stephenson observed that they were the healthiest people he had ever seen. He saw virtually no obesity or disease. Stephenson believed that the high saturated fat content of the Inuit diet was the mechanism allowing this people was the mechanism allowing these people to thrive 70 to 80% of total inuit calories came from fat stephenson observed that fat was the most precious dietary input to every inuit he observed upon hunting a caribou the inuit people would savor the fat deposits behind the eye and jaw in addition to the organs and, sh and shoulder the leaner parts were fed to the dogs. This contrasted the nutritional narrative that individuals like John Harvey Kellogg were pushing at the time. That's, that's like Kellogg, like Kellogg cereal, by the way. Religious fanatics like Kellogg believed that raw vegetables and grains were, were virtuous and meat and saturated fats were sinful. Yeah, this guy thought like you shouldn't eat meat because it makes you like too like vigorous and too like uh gives you too big of a sexual drive and gives you impure thoughts all these crazy thoughts like all these crazy things <laughs> so yeah don't don't eat kellogg cereal just for that <laughs> anyways western doctors also believed the inuit diet to be vitamin deficient and dangerous 
Stephenson saw a different perspective. As the Inuit population, he observed, was utterly thriving. Stephenson saw saw a different perspective as the Inuit population he observed was utterly thriving. He also realized that the oils, livers, and fish offered essential nutrients. In addition, Stephenson himself ate a native Inuit diet for years starting in 1906 when his food supplies failed to show up during his voyage that year. He couldn't believe how good he felt on the Arctic diet that consisted of fish, meat, and saturated fat. To properly, monitor his carniv- to properly monitor his carnivore experiment, Stephenson checked himself into New York's Bellevue Hospital with a fellow explorer. They spent multiple weeks receiving blood tests and had various biomarkers checked. After the control period ended, their staple foods they consumed were very simple. They ate steak, roast beef, brains, tongue, calf liver once per week to prevent scurvy and were committed to this for an entire calendar year. Wow, that's crazy. I don't, I don't think I could do that. <laughs> I like having some variety. And there's got to be some salt too, like Jesus Christ. Newspapers, periodicals, and various doctors condemned Stephenson's experiment as dangerous. They insisted that the men would get scurvy or even potentially die. Stephenson defied all critics and insisted that his all-meat diet filled him with ambition and energy. <laughs> Upon examining the two men during their year-long experiment, the doctors reported that their, neither man showed elevated blood pressure or kidney troubles that were expected of a carnivore diet. Stephenson became ill only once during the year, and this is when the experiments had him cut out the fat from his meat and eat leaner cuts. This illness was quickly corrected by a meal of sirloin steak and brains cooked in bacon fat. His symptoms immediately improved. Well, I didn't fact check that. I don't know how true that is, but, you know, I'm sure, you know, some things have to be dramatized a little bit. (laughs) The men also ensured that they did not contract, contract scurvy because they were intentional about eating the entire animal, including the bones, organs, and brain. At the end of the year, both men reported that they felt fantastic and were in amazing health. Stephenson concluded that the protein of the all-meat diet was not as important as the fat. In 1955, Stephenson adopted a Stone Age diet that was high-fat, low-carb, and primarily meat. He was notorious for eating globs of butter on a spoon. (laughs) I love eating globs of butter. (laughs) But yeah, so this is a pretty amazing story, right? Like, uh, never heard of this before. And then I just kind of searched the name and see if I could find anything. Of course, like I already said, I found a Wikipedia article. And yeah, like right in there, they talk about this uh, experiment that he did. At the very end of the Wikipedia article, it says... There were no deficiency problems while eating only the kind of fatty meat they requested. The two men remained healthy. Their bowels remained normal, except that their stools were smaller and did not smell. (laughs) Sounds like a positive to me. (laughs) Smaller poops that don't smell as bad. Sign me up. (laughs) It also in here, it says Stephenson's gingivitis disappeared by the end of the experiment although there was an increase in the deposit of tartar on his teeth. Okay, so a little bit more tartar for less gingivitis. I think that's a good trait as well. During the experiment, his intake varied between 2,000 and 3,000 calories per day, and he derived an average of almost 80% of his energy from animal fat and only 20% from animal protein. The actual breakdown goes something like this. The daily intake varied from 100 to 140 grams of protein, 200 to 300 grams of fat, and about 7 to 12 grams of carbs. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I don't, like I, I've tried the carnivore diet and even like not a real carnivore diet because it was like with fruit and everything. But I think the longest I could last was, what, like three weeks? I couldn't even last the fourth week just because it's too restrictive. It's just like, I don't know, I like like variety in food. So, yeah, it's just not for me. But, I mean, 
I could see how like this guy's an explorer, you know, goes off into like the Arctic and is hanging out with the Inuit and there's not much to do anyway. So, you know, he learns their culture, their traditions, gets into the food and then like that makes sense. Like when you don't have any other choice anyway, then yeah, you're going to get into it and, and enjoy it. But when you have so much food out there in front of you, like taunting you, <laughs> you can't do this. Unless, like, you're really sick and you have to, like, I don't know, do this as a way of, you know, healing your body. Yeah, that's my take. All right. So with that said, going to bring the podcast home. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Appreciate you coming back and enjoying the episode week in and week out. You guys are the best friends and family. Love you all. Reach out if you have any questions or concerns. You can always find me on social media at jmartfit on Instagram and Twitter. Jmart moves on Facebook. And as I always say, stay active, be grateful. Jmart out. <laughs>